Good morning and welcome to Advent Lutheran Church. We are so happy that you are part of our worshiping community this morning. If you would like a bulletin so that you can participate in this worship service, you can find one at our webpage, which is www.adventlu.org. Also on our webpage are lots of uh, different opportunities, uh, information about how you can get plugged in to the mission and ministry of Advent. I'd like to thank all of you for the uh, gifts that you offer, your time, talent, and treasure. And I'd also like to remind you that there are several ways of, of getting your financial uh, gifts to the church during these days. You can either mail them to Advent Lutheran, which is uh, 8840 University City Boulevard. You can also bring them to the church, which is, of course, at the same address. And then there's online giving, and there's a link on the e-news as well as on our webpage. Our ministries uh, continue to work uh, very hard to keep everyone engaged uh, during this extended period of COVID-19, and your support uh, is very much needed and appreciated. Our worship continues with the call to worship. Gather us, O God, and we will know your life that makes us one. Gather us, O God, and we will celebrate our variety and uniqueness. Gather us, O God, and we will give you the pain of our brokenness. Gather us, O God, and we will share the gifts of your Spirit. Trinity of love, braid us as one. That our brokenness be healed by you. That our fears be held by you. That our gifts be used by you that our lives be offered to you, so that the world may know your reign of love. Amen. Where people squabble, peace be among us. Where races fight, peace be among us. Where neighbors argue, peace be among us. Where nations disagree, peace be among us. Where Christ's disciples gather, peace be our way. The peace of the Lord be with you. God, you set us free from our loneliness by the touch of another's hand. You deliver us from our selfishness so we may be of service to others. You break the chains of our pride so we might walk with you in humility. Christ of love, when we cling to our anger, you send forgiveness to take us by the hand. When we harbor bitterness, you place in our hands the bread of heaven when we drink from the stagnant waters of sin, you share with us the cup of salvation. Spirit of new life, you gather us as the body of Christ to teach us how to live together, to love together, and to serve together, so that the world might know that you indeed dwell among us. Amen. This morning's reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. So mortal, 
I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel comes to us this day, as does Christ, from the gospel of Matthew, the 18th chapter. Jesus said to his disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when you too are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the, re- if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, Truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the gospel of our Lord. It's been said that all you need for an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting is a coffee pot and a resentment. When I look back to those early days of sobriety, where I was just holding on for dear life from one day to the next, I know that I drove everyone completely crazy, especially my dad. He'd been in the rooms of AA for around 10 years before I finally started to realize that I couldn't stand myself anymore, drunk or sober. I lived with him for the first six months after getting out of treatment, and we would go to several AA meetings together each week. On the way to the meeting, I'd be angry with some resentment about another person or something that was going on. The hour-long meeting would give me just a respite. And then we'd get back in the car, and I'd pick up the earlier resentment or find a new one that frustrated me to be angry about. I'm surprised my dad never pulled over and made me walk home. I was a mess. I was a piece of work. I know I was horrible and a miserable person to be around. 
holding on to the most ridiculous of resentments that felt so all-consuming at the time, filled with bitterness, eaten up with unforgiveness, dead on the inside and completely unavailable for any meaningful relationship with another person, let alone God, who at the time I wasn't all that sure about. The very thing I needed the most was the very thing I resisted. Community. I didn't know it during those early days of sobriety, but every meeting I made was building a foundation for community. A real community. A true fellowship. A place where people from all walks of life gathered and talked about their struggles with alcohol, the relationships they had lost, the resentments they held on to, the baggage they carried but wanted to let go of, the fears they tried to cover up, the brokenness they still hoped would one day be healed, and the unforgiveness they had, they had let imprison them for far too long. I know a lot of my sermons reference my sobriety, and that's because if it were not for the rooms of AA, then I'm not sure I would have made it back into the fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. As many of us in AA have discovered, there's an organic connection between the spirituality we experience in a church basement around a coffee pot and the forgiving God that we discover in a sanctuary around a cup of wine and a loaf of bread. Each time I read Matthew 18, I'm reminded of how fragile Christian communities really are. We often forget this. Then we start talking about relationships that we share with each other. And then we start taking those relationships for granted. We get sloppy with our words and our actions. We cut corners with the responsibilities we have with each other. We neglect the opportunities to share in the fellowship with each other. Until, that is, COVID hits and We've not been able to physically gather for almost six months. But we put our own priorities ahead of our commitment to serve another member. We procrastinate when we need to seek forgiveness. We postpone what I call the daily tending to our sphere of relationships until we have before us a mountain of deferred maintenance. The Christian community in a case like this becomes an unweeded garden and we hardly know where to start. Jesus was well aware of the fragility of the nascent community that he was forming around himself. He knew the danger of letting unforgiveness find root in the hearts of those who shared their lives together. Listen to his urgency in today's gospel. If another member of the church sins against you, go! Go and point out the fault when you two are alone. He anticipated how necessary it would be for the disciples to speak the truth in love to one another. Listen, he says. If a member listens to you, then you've regained that one. You've not lost the relationship with a brother or sister, Jesus says. And Jesus also knew how difficult the practice of seeking forgiveness would be even for the healthiest of communities. That's why he gives Specific instructions, step by step, on the process of reconciliation with another. Go and point it out. Take one or two others along with you. Tell it to the church. For any of us who've hung around church for a while, we more than likely have had the need to address another person in the community. This requires confrontation, and I know personally that I would rather do anything else but to confront another. So, I make up all these elaborate excuses, and I rationalize why it would be just easier to let it go and move on. Unfortunately, we do the relationship a disservice and find ourselves simply tolerating the person. This scenario may sound harmless, but imagine an entire Christian community that just tolerates each other. Every Sunday would be like having a Thanksgiving dinner with people you really can't stand. As we know, 
there's only so much a person can tolerate. Some of you may be thinking, there's no one that I really need to seek forgiveness from. I get along with everybody. But for at least 50% of you, I can guarantee that you are that person who is on the other side of the equation. In fact, someone may be using your church directory picture as a beer coaster right now. Before I start feeling holier than thou, my picture may very well be under one of your beers too. But the alternative to the practice of seeking forgiveness and offering forgiveness is to live in what I call a pseudo-community where we pretend and walk around on eggshells before we can get to the church parking lot and tell someone else exactly how we feel about so-and-so. And a few bless their hearts and I don't like to talk about them behind their backs to make ourselves feel better, a little more Christian. All that we've done when we do this is to engage in a behavior that tears at the very integrity of a community. And after all, what is integrity? But the truthfulness of a community which gives it strength. A Lutheran church that I attended before going to seminary was in Hickory, North Carolina. It was on Springs Road. I attended a Lutheran church, and right across the street was another Lutheran church, and about a quarter mile down the road was another Lutheran church. Now, I don't know whether this is factual or not, but a lot of the folks at the Lutheran church I attended spoke about how they were the first Lutheran church there on Springs Road, And of course, some people got mad and started the Lutheran church across the road. And then of course, other people got mad and then started the other Lutheran church, which is actually named after the Lutheran church that I was a part of, just a quarter mile down the road. Oftentimes, this is what happens in the life of congregations. People get mad and they leave They start another congregation, and then those folks get mad and, of course, start another congregation. They keep moving further and further away from one another. Barbara Brown Taylor uh, writes uh, a sermon in which she makes reference to C.S. Lewis's book called The Great Divorce. Taylor says that for Lewis, hell is like the vast gray city a city inhabited only at its outer edges, with rows and rows of empty houses in the middle, with their neighbors and all the neighbors who have moved and quarreled with them to new neighborhoods, leaving empty streets as they move away, leaving empty houses behind them. That, C.S. Lewis says, is how hell got to be so large. Empty at the center and inhabited only by the fringes because everyone in it chose to distance themselves instead of doing the central but sometimes difficult work of forgiveness. Barbara Brown Taylor goes on to say that the part of Christian community, the part that brings the community back together that has distanced itself, itself, of course, is the willingness to do the hard work of confrontation. The willingness to say that this relationship is important enough for me to risk seeking forgiveness from a brother or sister or offering forgiveness to a brother or sister. That this community, this Christian community, no matter how fragile it may be, is important enough to do the work of forgiveness. Barbara Brown Taylor says, when we do this, it is like throwing a block party smack in the deserted center of hell, and to fill that place with so much music and laughter, such merriment and mutual affection, that all the far-flung residents of that gray city come creeping back from their distant outpost 
to see what the fuss is, the light and the joy of community is all about. Throwing a party, gathering the community back together. That's one of the things that I so appreciate about the community of Advent Lutheran. We're not a perfect community, but we're a community that's willing to hold on to each other, to do the hard work of seeking and offering forgiveness to one another. We're a community that knows how to do that hard work, not always perfectly, but a community that knows how fragile but indispensable the Christian community is to the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. But we're also a community that knows how to gather, to gather around for a party, the party that we call the Eucharist, the great thanksgiving, a place where we receive the body of Christ given for you, the place where we receive the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. After all, it is community. Community is the place that we learn how to be Christians. How to be people that love one another. That hang on to each other. For you know there are no Lone Ranger Christians. It is not a solo activity. It is a community endeavor. After all, I need you to hold me accountable. After all, I need you to tell me you are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. After all, I need you to place in my hands the body of Christ. I need you to place in my hands the cup of salvation, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. our faith with the words of the Ionic Creed. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, water and earth, of the bread and beauty of all humanity. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows he died forsaken, 
he descended into earth to the place of death. On the third day he rose from the tomb, he ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of the Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of eternal life. Amen. Lord, look on your world. We know the world is so fractured and filled with chaos and crises of our own making. Teach us to pray, and when we struggle to pray, may your Spirit intercede with the words we cannot find. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord of all faithfulness, you live at the heart of all of our gatherings and reveal yourself in the midst of two or three. You call a broken people around your table. In times of disagreement, teach us to listen. Free us from prejudice and bind us to your way of forgiving grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all justice, you are the one who raises up those who are bent low. So we pray for those held down by the grindings of life and the indifference of the world. By the power of your Holy Spirit, give us the courage and the boldness to work towards abolishing social structures which continue to perpetuate racial practices and policies in our own communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all compassion, you call us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers as dear to us as our own needs. We pray for all of our sisters and brothers who seek comfort, healing, refuge, rest, peace, wholeness, community, acceptance, and unconditional love. We especially pray today for Abby Boston and Jesse Amaker, the Ashton family, Josh Baker, Lindsay Baker, Lamont Bell, Ann Brown, Talia Amaker's mother, Frida Christ, Ann Faraby. We lift up Emma Fettig, Eileen Folkerth, Jennifer Gazda, Richard Henderson, Dick Kuklentz, and Waylon Kuklentz. We pray for Phyllis Lester, Ray Matthews, Rick Messina, Hilda Mertz, Justin Mertz, Caroline Morton, and Tyler Odman. We pray for Anita Ortiz, Calvin Roberson, Shannon Roberson, for Richard Schultz, Myra Steele, and we lift up Kirby Strickland and his family. We pray for Mary Faith Strickland, Linda Ann Wassum, for Beverly and Lewis Williams, Lisa Williams, Terry and Carol Wisner, and for Jeff Woods. We now pray aloud or in the silence of our hearts for those we wish to name. We give thanks for the marriage of Kristen and Adam Boston, son of Abby and Phil Boston, and for the marriage of Brianna and Ian Stemmick, son of Laurie Stemmick. We pray for them as they begin their married lives together. And we remember and celebrate the lives of those who have died, especially Grace Stegall, aunt of Lisa Williams, Marlene Quigley, aunt of Jenny Henderson, Nell Clayton, aunt of Janet Rasmussen. We also remember and we give thanks for the life of Carol, Beckenweiss Johnson, mother of Brenda Sassinia. We also remember and give thanks for the life of Giovanna Aparicio Aragon, daughter of Mercedes Aragon, at the second anniversary of her death. By your Holy Spirit, comfort their families and all who grieve. Give peace to those who mourn. Strengthen all through the promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus. 
We pray for all communities and all people who have been impacted by Hurricane Laura. Strengthen and protect all relief workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, on this Labor Day weekend, we remember those who have no work, who are struggling to provide for their families, and who despair of ever finding employment again. Open our hearts to see the needs of the unemployed and the underemployed, and to respond with compassion and support. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, take the time and gifts you have entrusted to us and teach us how to use them to give others the abundant life of Jesus so that your people may rejoice in the new life you give. For you are the life giver and we are your servants. Amen. struggle for justice and peace. May you know the support of family, friends, and people who feel as passionately about the world as you do. May you feel a part of the great cloud of witnesses who through the ages did God's work and prayed for the coming of the kingdom. May you never feel alone, and if you do, may you carry in your heart the words of Jesus who told his friends, I am with you always. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.